Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are joining. Welcome to this webinar on uh, pitfalls to avoid when implementing continuous delivery at enterprise level. So you might be wondering, so that, that's an interesting uh, topic uh, because it's always good to learn from mistakes and then not doing everything on, uh, by yourself. So uh, let's get started. Uh, a bit about me, I work as a technical consultant uh, at Devon. Uh, so Devon is a, a technology consulting company. Uh, we are based out of Netherlands. Uh, we also have offices in uh, Germany, India and uh, a satellite office in UK. So we are, so to say, international company. Um, I uh, am a trainer from scrum.org. Uh, I give trainings on a professional scrum developer course and PSM and PSPO. And I'm also a trainer from Microsoft. Uh, I teach uh, all ALM and TFS related uh, uh, topics. Um, and I also help uh, enterprises implement continuous delivery. I currently live in Netherlands uh, for past three years, uh, working with uh, major financial organizations here, uh, helping them with their DevOps journey and implementing CI, CD uh, in those organizations. You can reach me uh, via Twitter at any given point of time. Uh, my Twitter handle is mentioned here. It's a funny BCA. Uh, so I'm more than happy to take any questions maybe during uh, this webinar or uh, later. Uh, I have my colleague Lisa uh, with me who is moderating this uh, webinar. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, type in. Uh, so I'll uh, get them uh, via Lisa and I'll try to answer um, yeah, as many as I can uh, in the given time. All right, okay, so let's get started. It's a, the reason why I chose this topic is, uh, so some wise man uh, basically said that, uh, you know, life is too short to make all mistakes by yourself. And of course, one of the key benefit by making mistakes is that you get to learn from it, uh, but in today's day and age uh, in a business, you are not, you really can't afford to make too many mistakes uh, so you can learn. So the best thing is uh, to learn from each other. Um, so that's, that's the main intention of this webinar uh, is to share uh, some of the pitfalls that I encountered uh, while uh, working with uh, large enterprises uh, implementing CI, CD. Um, and my lessons from it and uh, hopefully that will help you uh, to speed up your journey or to avoid those pitfalls. So before we start, uh, let's set some, you know, a common base ground because there uh, are different definitions. Every organization have their own interpretation of this uh, terminology of what CI or continuous integration means, continuous delivery or deployment. So for me, for this talk, uh, my base is for me, Continuous integration is when some code change happens, when a developer check in some code into a version control system, then there is a build available. So for me that I qualify as continuous integration. Of course, there are some, uh, some quality gateways, uh, I mean uh, uh, like your unit tests and code cyclometric complexity are basically static code analysis and those kind of things. So different uh, quality gates are there, uh, but for me, in general, continuous integration means check-in, results, a build. Continuous delivery, uh, on other hand, uh, a code commit, if every quality gateway passes, then it should, we should have a shippable product. So basically, we have a product where we are just waiting for someone to push a button. So those changes can be deployed to production. So for me, that's the definition of continuous delivery. So in an ideal world, so that someone would be some a business owner who would choose what features will go to production uh, at what time. And continuous deployment, um, the way I see it, any code change that happens, if it passes all quality gateways, it ends up in production without any manual intervention. So that's the, uh, basis I come from uh, and uh, the difference between continuous delivery and deployment for me is 
whether it's completely automated uh, or is it some manual intervention required, not for any other purpose, but basically to decide at what time you want to go to production. So that's where uh, continuous delivery stands. All right. Uh, so if you actually notice the, the theme of this webinar is pitfalls when implementing continuous delivery at an enterprise. So why is enterprise so different? Before I go into that, let's try to understand what are some common pitfalls do you see while implementing continuous delivery. So some of the pitfalls that I've seen uh, are things like development teams using a shared database during development. Uh, so that leads to there is one central database, every developer making changes are connecting with, uh, to the same database. Uh, so at times it results so somebody change, tries to change a column, uh, but then that change is not promoted to other people, then people have to stop, get the latest, you know, those kind of things. Other challenges could be something like how your application code is structured. I've seen some instances where there is one Git repo or uh, one repository where different applications are bundled. So every time there is a build trigger, then it, the whole multiple applications get built and then it takes enormous amount of time. Uh, or things like ignoring fail builds, uh, not having proper notification when build uh, fails, or even if there are notifications, uh, none of the team members looking at uh, those interventions. Uh, not keeping everything in version control or using wrong tooling, like for example, since we have licenses for UFT, let's use UFT to test, to automate every type of test. Or we have licenses from IBM Rational Workbench, so let's use that to do all sort of testing. So these are some of the pitfalls that I see. However, the theme of this webinar, I'm not going to discuss any of these because these are more on implementing on how you uh, work or develop or uh, uh, progress with implementing a pipeline, development practi uh, practices, and also the whole uh, notion of engineering excellence. So that, in my opinion, is same whether you're working for a small organization or a medium or an enterprise. The focus of this webinar is what kind of unique challenges that you might encounter when you are uh, trying to implement continuous delivery at an enterprise. So why are enterprises different? Well, enterprises are different because they are more complex uh, because of uh, the sheer size, the volume of operations, uh, the number of systems they have, the diversity of tooling, and uh, more importantly, a lot of enterprises usually work with a lot of distributed teams. That adds additional complexity uh, when you want to implement continuous delivery. So because of these various reasons, uh, implementing continuous delivery in a small or a medium organization uh, compared to enterprise uh, poses different set of challenges. I'm not discarding the, the, the previous challenges we discussed uh, in terms of engineering excellence, uh, the right practices, and so those are still valid, but I want to focus more on what are those unique things uh, that, uh, you know, most probably you might see at enterprises. Basically, my experience, uh, I've, as I said, from past three years, I'm working with major financial institutes, uh, uh, institutions in uh, Netherlands. Um, and all my experiences I've drawn from uh, my past three years working at large enterprises. Before that, I was working at uh, a small to medium enterprises. Uh, there, the challenges are bit different uh, when you deal with enterprises. So let's look at uh, some of my mistakes uh, that I've seen in past three years. They're actually quite a lot. Uh, so as you could see, uh, well, apparently I made too many mistakes, I guess. Uh, but the thing is, uh, yeah, <laughs> of course, <laughs> you learn from them. Uh, but the key thing, so in the given time, I don't think I would be able to touch uh, on all these things, but on a high level, uh, as you could see, some of them, uh, the teams still not focusing on done. Let's say every scrum team, uh, they have something called definition of done. However, their definition of done ends when we are in QA or in staging or whatever. Done means going into production. So this is one of the critical thing. A lot of uh, uh, teams in enterprise, they cannot achieve this because of whatever 
a, a existing uh, processes or uh, the compliance issues or whatever that is. Uh, so that is uh, a problem with uh, not having a done increment. Even though team is meeting a definition of done, but that does your definition of done really include moving to production? I have not seen any team so far. Let me put it like that. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, however, what I'm going to do in this webinar is talk a little bit more in detail on these three major pitfalls that I see. Because these are things that I see uh, almost every customer that I work with, uh, that these are the three usual suspects, so to say, uh, that stand out. First one, lack of business alignment. Well, let me ask you this question. Um, how many of you think um, IT is a cost center? Uh, if you actually talk to a lot of enterprises, they even today consider IT as a cost center. I mean, it's something that incurs some cost, but our real business is banking. Our real business is airline. Our real business is their whatever they perceive as a core business. But if you actually look at it, now every industry or every domain, the core of their operations are all IT centric. How good or how best you can leverage market purely depends on how well are your IT systems. Let me ask you a simple question. Let's say Google. Do you think IT is their core business or do you think it's their uh, a cost center? Do you think for Facebook, IT is their core business or a cost center or for Twitter? So I'm, I'm sure most of you might think, yes, for these companies, yes, IT is their core business. I mean, their engineering excellence and the, 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 the innovation that they do with their software products, that's their core business. Yeah, that's true. But let me ask you a question. So for a bank, let's say, for example, ING, what do you think is their core business? Banking? If you actually listen to their uh, uh, CIO, Ron Van Kaminada, who appeared in a lot of public conferences. And when I was working as a consultant there, uh, helping with their DevOps journey, um, so it was a clear message from CIO that we are an IT company having to have, I mean, just happen to have a banking license. So the reason why that message is clearly sent out within the organization and it was also said across multiple public platforms. And so there are really nice, interesting videos available in YouTube. Uh, so how the ING transformation, in fact, that's one of the uh, biggest transformation I was part of, uh, which I'm really proud because the kind of progress that they made uh, was phenomenal. In fact, they are looked upon as one of the, uh, you know, example cases, uh, how a financial institution who are known to be more conservative could implement radical changes with whole DevOps and CI and CD. Um, so the point I want to make is, any business, it doesn't matter whether you're in banking, automobile, transportation, it doesn't matter. The core business is your, how well your IT systems uh, function, how flexible and how uh, fast can they adapt and deliver value. Now, having said that, lot of organizations still do not consider that. They still think their core business area is something else and then IT is just a cost center. In such instances, the key problems, what challenges that you might encounter? The first and foremost, budget. Who should pay for it? Should business pay for it or should IT pay for it? So in all my assignments, this was a never ending discussion. Who should pay for it? Where do we get time from it? So in the end, with one of the business stakeholder, we said, say, we, of course, you have to explain all the benefits of CA and CD, but end of the day, people will ask, am I going to get new features? Maybe not today, but maybe 
in a long run things will be faster but that sometimes it is hard to sell and IT is always the IT uh, department was always pushing back but hey this is not something that we should pay for it but think about it if you save some cost because you became faster or you improved your quality or your the maintenance days have gone down or the number of defects have gone down or whatever who is going to get benefit out of it. So if as an IT department if you say that hey you know what once you become better then we are going to charge less to business then it is a different story. However if you say no that is not going to happen so that is the discussion that you need to have. So the pitfall number one in terms of business alignment who should pay for it. So make sure that you have a clear expectation on that. So think about from an aspect that if things improve who is going to benefit from it is business or IT. If you are charging back to business will that change are you going to change that so those are the aspects that you need to consider. The second part of it is time as you know business is always under constant pressure that we need features like yesterday. Uh, however you see more often that uh, in order to focus more on delivering features the always trade off uh, uh, tr the, the trade off that is taken is not focusing on improvements. So it is like this how much time you want to spend on chopping trees and how much time you want to spend on sharpening your axe. So that is always a trade off. So make sure you align with your business on that aspect. So this is another pitfall that we constantly encountered one is uh, the, the, the budget who should pay for it and uh, the other one is time. So do we get enough time? The way we solve this problem is we made explicit agreements with uh, the business that every sprint x percentage of time will be spent on uh, CI and CD activities. So looks like we have a question. Yeah, and I'm not even sure if it's a question or maybe a challenge to you because I hear Jerry is uh, saying here that he's not sure if he is agreeing that for banking IT is core business because in the end the bank does not deliver IT to the end user. IT services are used to deliver banking products to the end user, better, faster, etc. And maybe you can share your thoughts on that. Okay, excellent. So the it's an interesting discussion because the reason why I say that is because if you look at uh, the new European regulations which changed uh, a couple of years back that now banks are expected to provide their customer information uh, to other parties of course with when, when customer agrees. So this actually opened up immense opportunities for, for, for the small players or niche players but at the same time it put the banking domain in a position where it is uh, not any more, more protected uh, kind of a, a, a model because now tomorrow Google can come and with their very specific offering if I am willing to share my data with uh, a provider uh, because of the new regulation now bank is obligated to do that uh, when I s ask my bank to share all my financial information with a party uh, they are obligated to do that then the, the, the banking services you do not need a bank to carry out. So if you look at the kind of changes that are happening in recent past the things like the different payment models that have come in the things like the, the whole PSD2 that is coming in so uh, with different wallets that are coming in uh, so like uh, mobile wallets and things like that. So the, the position how the banks were perceived in the financial sector couple of years back now they no longer enjoy the same status and in near future things are going to change even more. So if as a bank if you do not adapt or react to changing environment faster then the immense competition will obviously take the market share. So it is not a protected uh, uh, so to say environment which was uh, which banks used to enjoy a couple of years back because of all these regulations and things like that. So from that point of view. Uh, that that is why I say for any business IT is a really core of uh, their, their I, I, from their business model. There is a really interesting article that was published in uh, Harvard Business School called software is eating the world. So I am sure that will give you even more better insights why 
IT is now the enabler and it is at the center of every business strategy of every, uh, uh, of every organization. So I, I, I encourage you to also look at that article uh, which might give you a little bit more insight. Uh, so from where I am coming from and why uh, at least in Netherlands if I look at major financial institutions everyone are going are investing heavily on IT uh, because they see them as an enabler and also they see as a game changer in terms of getting the competitive edge in the market by responding fast and being more uh, uh, flexible in terms of delivering what is needed. Yeah, I hope that uh, answers. Uh, since I have a couple more topics to cover, I want to continue from this. Uh, but if you have more questions, feel free to uh, put it in the chat window and I'll try to answer them. So those were the things that I wanted to focus more on the business alignment. So this is the one of the most critical thing. Every time that I see this acts as a major uh, variable in terms of how successful CICD implementation in an enterprise goes. Because of if you do not have right alignment with business, that becomes extremely hard to implement. This, there is always this notion in the IT that implementing CICD is a technical thing. No, it is not a technical thing because you are doing to basically to impact the, your overall business flow. So that's why it is extremely important to align with business and uh, bring them on board sooner. Moving on, the second pitfall that I want to talk about which I encounter a lot is lack of growth culture and mindset. What do I mean by that? Especially some of these organizations that I work with, there are people who are working there for I don't know maybe 20 years, 30 years and they are more or less established uh, their standard way of working. When you try to work in more agile way, which is bit different than what they are used to, I have seen a uh, uh, considerable level of uh, resistance uh, that comes in uh, with this change. What is it to do with implementing CICD? Uh, at least the, the place where I am coming from, I see implementing CICD, of course, the implementing tools and pipelines and development practices is definitely a part of it but the major part is also how people react to the existing uh, uh, changes to the new process and how are they going to uh, look at the new feedback loops that are the result of implementing new tools and practices. Couple of things, uh, when you try to work in a DevOps team after a while it becomes extremely difficult if a person is uh, only an expert in one field. I am not suggesting that every person in a DevOps should have expertise in different fields or should be an expert in different fields. That is not what I am saying well, even though that is uh, extremely desirable. However, the ideal situation to go is to have some sort of a T-shaped model. So this, are, this is one of the things that we do, uh, that we encountered initially that when we started with one of my previous customers that there was a development team and operations and we said okay, so we have to start with a DevOps approach and we changed the organization structure and brought in some operations and development people together and they were working. But immediately we figured out that then even though people are working in a team, but they are not working as a team because everything is uh, individual sprints, uh, everyone is working in their individual silos and that was not really helping uh, to trigger the kind of uh, you know collective code ownership that we were looking for, the sense of accountability that we were expecting from the team. So what did we do? So we worked closely with the HR of the organization to sort of define some growth plans uh, in, uh, in another term we defined some sort of a, a T-shaped skill metrics for uh, the workforce. So in a nutshell, what it boiled down to is it said, hey, today you are an expert in field A or field B or field C. That's great. However, from next, in, in next one or two years, uh, depending on the amount of time those people spent in the organization, 
together with HR, we defined that in next one or two years, you also need to gain expertise in maybe test automation or maybe in Python programming or maybe something, whatever was relevant for that team. And from an organization point of view, we also supported with uh, the training, time, whatever budget that was required. But the, the idea was after that one or two years, this person also uh, sort of picks up additional skills. So that's the T-shaped skill model. The other thing that uh, we did uh, to encourage this whole growth culture uh, and the growth mindset was to establish some rhythm uh, in the organization. Uh, so we started something called uh, uh, Tech Thursdays, which means every Thursday, the whole day, the team spends on doing something, uh, learning something, and uh, experimenting uh, things. Uh, we, we started doing some hackathons every quarter. So these are some things that we did to sort of uh, trigger the whole engineering culture. So the focus is more on the engineering excellence. The focus is more on constantly focusing on the growth and expanding the technical skills and also being able to scale uh, more on a T-shaped model, uh, not only an expert in, in one field. So I see one more question from Lisa. Yes, so we have a question from Don Thompson, and he's asking what, what a company should do if they hear about CICD for the very first time. Should they try to implement it right away, or which three steps would you advise? Excellent question. Uh, so if you are new to CICD, my, uh, well, three things. Uh, number one, uh, try to plot your current landscape. What do I mean by that? So try to have a visualization of how your current value stream looks like. So start from when there is an idea that comes in. Uh, I assume, I don't know whether you are already doing or working in a scrum way of working or in an agile way. Uh, if not, so try to see when do you get uh, initial requirement and what steps that requirement has to go through before it ends up in production. Typically, it, usually it falls down into nine steps. You gather requirements, you do some analysis, you do some design, you do some coding, you do testing, you ensure, you, you create some documentation, you do some checks, and finally go to production. So these are typical st steps. However, what I would encourage in this whole uh, stream is to plot against timeline. How much time or what activities you had to do to do analysis, or what was the output of your design? So likewise, you plot the whole thing. That's step number one. Step number two, identify what are those manual tasks that you have to do every time. It could be every time before I go to production, I have to do manual testing or regression testing. Every time I have to go to production, I have to prepare a lengthy report or I have to create a run book to hand it over to operations team or whatever that is. So identify what are those bottlenecks or uh, the things that consume a lot of time and that's step number two. Step number three, identify your quick wins. So how do you do that? Number one, for example, uh, if you could change uh, to bring operations people to work closely with uh, development team, I'm not saying change your organization, organization structure and become a DevOps team. That's not what I'm saying because I don't, really uh, know your organization context. If possible, at least try to involve the operations guys sooner so they not only look at the run book but also see what our actually development team is already doing upfront. Try to automate. So if you do not have any automation and all your testing is manual, I highly suggest go with some functional test automation. Even though on a long run, you should try to focus more from a unit test level uh, to integration and then functional, but as a quick win, try to focus more on a black box testing. And number, uh, so other uh, low hanging fruit could be using a common repository, making sure that there is a common source code repository and set up a continuous integration. Not with all the quality gateways maybe, but at least to start with every time there is a change, uh, of code, then at least a build gets triggered. How many checks you do in the build? 
that you can constantly increase but make sure that your code is in a code repository and your developers start checking in code sooner. So once you have these things in place, you have a good starting point. Then the second part of it, uh, the, the pitfall that we discussed just now, make sure you get the business alignment. So talk to your business, explain them the, business, uh, the importance of it and also talk about the kind of impact. Remember, implementing continuous delivery in an enterprise is not cheap. It is not a cheap thing. So it needs a lot of time, effort, money. So make sure you get your business on board. Um, so these are the, some things that I recommend you to start with. Uh, and this will hopefully give you enough items uh, which will trigger uh, for your constant improvement. And if you are doing or if you are already working in an agile way, uh, so I'm sure you have some sort of retrospectives or something like that. If not, if you are still working in a traditional way, still I encourage you to sit uh, with the people from business and the teams who are implementing at least once a month to see what could be the next improvement. Come up with that roadmap. Always try to look back at your end-to-end uh, -end flow that you defined and see what could be the next step that you could add. Yeah. So hopefully these are some of the things that you could focus on. All right. So moving on. So having that growth culture so that is extremely important so always having that buzz in the organization otherwise okay we implemented ci we have some tools but after a while it sort of dies down there is a build that is failed no one really looks at it every time before we go to pro, uh, before we deploy to staging or then we carry out huge amount of tests then we get feedback too late and those kind of things so that's more from a process, but how people approach. So that mindset focusing on that is extremely important. So that was the second pitfall. Moving on to the third pitfall, which is for this webinar, this I want to make it last one. Um, underestimating the impact of continuous delivery. As I just discussed, implementing continuous delivery is not cheap. It not only cheap, but it is also extremely difficult, not only from a technical point of view, but also from uh, the organization process point of view, also between alignment between different departments, their governance structure. So, so many things would come into picture. So be prepared to deal with those situations. In one of my earlier assignments, we made an initial plan that, okay, so continuous integration, let's set up this tool, let's have this uh, as a, let's have an orchestration tool, let's do, let's use this framework for testing, blah, blah, blah. So we defined that, but very quickly we realized that you encounter so many problems that you don't foresee. For example, so we defined an initial backlog, uh, so based on the approach that we ju I just described, so ha plotting out the end-to-end -end flow and identifying the low-hanging fruit, and we defined a sort of a roadmap. And when we started implementing CI, we quickly ran into an issue that uh, we, we wanted to do some functional automation testing. And we wanted a new environment for that. To procure those servers, it took almost six weeks to, to procure one server. Not because team was able to do functional, uh, they were able to already create functional testing, they were able to improve their uh, CI infrastructure. However, to procure new servers, it took more time. And in some cases, we had to open a, a firewall, firewall port because of the regulations uh, or the, the compliance uh, issues in the organization, it took enormous amount of time. And we wanted to use a package to get that package on our build server. Every small bit and pieces, you, we used to hit so many roadblocks because the existing organization policies, the existing IT rules, they were limiting us to really work in agile way. So be prepared that implementing CI, CD, you touch upon so many areas within the organization uh, where you might hit in so many roadblocks. So how did we solve this? Uh, in one of the organizations that I'm currently working with, the management really made a bold decision to solve this by adapting, uh, to, uh, um, by deciding to use public cloud as their hosting uh, provider. Well, was it an easy change? No. It almost took one year for us to certify this cloud provider uh, 
to be compliant with our uh, organization standards. However, now that we have, so every team now they are able to create infrastructure as code and they are able to spin up new machines whenever they need and then throw them off and able to keep up with it. So that is why the impact of CD not just uh, uh, is something that you cannot deal with only within the team or within the department. It touches maybe perhaps risk, your compliancy, your business and uh, sometimes it could also touch upon different regulatory requirements. So be prepared for it and that is where plotting your existing end to end process flow would already help you to identify what are those areas which you want to focus more. So these uh, are the three main pitfalls that I wanted to discuss in this webinar and I am sure there are a bunch of other ones which you have seen uh, in your experience and there are other things perhaps uh, which I would like to discuss some other time. Um, but I am curious if you have any more questions uh, and I am uh, you can always reach me on my Twitter handle uh, that I sh uh, and these slides will also be available and you could also watch this video recording uh, at a later point of time also which will be available uh, via YouTube. Do we have any more questions Lisa? I do have a question myself actually, it wasn't asked in the chat but I hear a lot about money and management but also about culture and I am curious as to how you see it, would you recommend it being implemented top down or bottom up? Oh, that is an excellent question. Uh, how do you implement continuous delivery? So I have seen both situations. Uh, for example, in one of my assignments, so the management or the architecture group uh, together with the, the, uh, the project leadership of uh, this CICD implementation project, they defined the tool set. Of course, they looked at some existing teams, they defined, uh, okay, so this is what our tool going to be for version control, this is what it is going to be for uh, our orchestration tool or a build tool or test automation tool, etc, etc. However, we quickly ran into uh, a challenge that uh, teams were complaining, ah, we want to do but we use, we are so special but this cannot work. But then we had to spend so much time and energy in uh, basically explaining, okay, why this is a right tool or wrong tool. On the other hand, it is also a main uh, uh, problem that I see that if you let teams to completely self-organize themselves, then they use all sort of tools. I have seen some teams started using some open source uh, tool which was developed somewhere in South America with only one contributor. Well, I do not know how secure that is to be used in a, in, in a financial sector, but then there is always that balance. So the, at, at least what worked best for us was we defined a pool of tools. For example, for a uh, version control system, you could use either GitLab or you could use VSTS. It is up to you, use any of those but you have to choose from only those two options. For testing, you could use Selenium, you could use UFT or you could use IBM Rational Workbench, that is it, nothing else. If you have a really valid case, then please come to us convince us then we add. So the best approach that worked for us is to, it is a mix of both top down and bottom up. So from a top down you provide enough options for the teams and let team has that freedom and flexibility to pick uh, whatever works best for them. Yeah. Yeah, two more questions by Jerry. Let us start with the first that is uh, he sees a big challenge prioritizing activities across different teams. Do you also see this challenge? Yeah, absolutely. So especially when you implement continuous delivery at an enterprise, unlike uh, you know small or medium organizations where the end-to-end -end value stream is defined by one or two applications which is typically owned by one or two teams, when you move to enterprise level, the, you are to deliver end-to-end -end value or basically your value stream consists of different application blocks and in some cases one application block itself could have let us say four or five different scrum teams working for one application block. So it is extremely important to have that alignment when you want to go to production because uh, let me take a hypothetical example. Let us say you are working on a mortgage app. So in order to implement a feature, 
uh, you need to make some uh, you need to make some changes to your CRM because that's where you get some customer data and then there is another part of application which does some credit checks which is handled by different department and then there is uh, some other department which does customer facing like a portal application or whatever in order to build one functionality these three different application blocks have to come together now how do you make it happen the way i have seen best work is in two parts number one from a business or a process point of view it is extremely important for business owners or the product owners so to say to have a clear alignment on, on this how it is done it is purely organization dependent uh, so every every organization uh, figures out their own way but the bottom line is it is extremely important to have that alignment to make sure that the business is aligned and have those priorities in place now what does it mean for technical teams a uh, couple of things you need to have cer certain practices in place one of the main thing that i have seen extremely useful is something called end to end testing it is important to have test automation at your uh, building block level which is quite useful to give you uh, feedback all the way from granular unit test to all the way to the functional thing but the more important thing is to have your end to end flow uh, which is when you come when you tie all these application blocks together do you have a mechanism to run through a, the whole end to end test for example if i trigger a money transfer now it goes to other uh, uh, bank it debits and then i get an acknowledgement and uh, finally i see a email or something in my account for example so do you have a test case which touches on all these different building blocks and how do you do uh, how do you maintain test data for this such a long running or a, a scenario which runs across multiple uh, blocks uh, the other thing is do you have right environments so you where you could test this functionality so that second thing the third uh, aspect to consider is the diversity of your continuous delivery pipelines so that's also one pitfall uh, that i did not discuss today is in enterprises if you do not have a, a proper uh, uh, control so to say it is really easy to end up with numerous uh, deployment pipelines that will pose lot of challenges so to having that alignment of pipelines different uh, among different building blocks also is quite important when you work uh, in such a situation so i would say these are top top three things that you need to consider uh, when you work in a, uh, in an enterprise where multiple building blocks have to come together yeah what jerry also suggests is that some scalable agile model would become very necessary such as safe perhaps yeah absolutely so any so as i said so implementing continuous delivery is not only from a tooling or a technology point of view but the process also dictates heavily on how successful your implementation can be it could be safe it could be nexus uh, it could be any other model but the key thing is do you have a mechanism where you have a better or a very close alignment with business do you have a mechanism where you get feedback loop much tighter and smaller feedback loop within your team feedback loop across your teams and feedback loop across your different building blocks do you have such a mechanism maybe for example safe has a release train with a rhythm and things like that for nexus it is something else for every process uh, is different and uh, so to sum it up yes absolutely you need to also focus on the process uh, and the requirement flow on how you promote from idea to production the whole process need to be looked at. so you need to have a whole systems view not only a isolated team view or application view thank you all right so thank you for joining for this webinar uh, watch out for this space uh, we will be publishing more webinars uh, every month on uh, different topics uh, do sign up for uh, our upcoming webinars Thank you. Have a good day.